Hello everyone and welcome to lecture series on economic survey 2022-23. This is lecture number 8. Today we are going to cover chapter 3 of economic survey whose title is Fiscal Developments Revenue Relish. We have divided this chapter into four parts. The first part talks about the fiscal developments related to central government. For example, first of all, we will look at the basic meaning of budget. In that, we will look into two things, revenue budget and capital budget. Then we will have a deeper understanding of what is the meaning of deficit. So for example, uh, we would learn budgetary deficit, revenue deficit, effective revenue deficit, fiscal deficit, headline fiscal balance and primary balance. Headline fiscal balance and primary balance is a very important tool which is used by IMF to look at the health of the governments. Then we will look at the trends in the budget. After that, we are going to do an analysis of what is the nature of the expenditure by government of India. Is the quality of expenditure good or not so good? After doing that, we will have a small discussion on two concepts. The first is called as counter cyclical fiscal policy and second is called as pro cyclical fiscal policy. These are the two types of fiscal policies. Having looked at the position of central government, we will have a look at the state government's fiscal developments. So we will look at overall trend, then deficits, and we will also look at some of the recent steps taken by state governments to increase their revenue. Once we look at center and state, we will combine them and we will look at the overall fiscal position of India, which means center and state combined. When we combine center and state, it is called as general government. So we are going to look at the resource mobilization between center and state and second, the general government finances. Towards the end of today's lecture, we will have a look at how the government of India borrows money and whether the borrowing of government of India is sustainable or not. That is called as government liability. So we'll have a look at the meaning of the liability. What are the different types of liability of the government? Then the trend of the debt and then an analysis of how long a government can go and borrow money from the market. According to experts, whenever an economy suffers from crisis, there are two methods to come out of it. First is fiscal policy, second is monetary policy. But the best method to be used to help the economy come out of crisis is a combination of fiscal and monetary policy. So before we look deeper into this topic, let us look at what the government of India has done to integrate fiscal and monetary policy to help the Indian economy come out of crisis. When COVID crisis hit the Indian economy, the first thing done by government of India was to help the vulnerable section of the society by providing them food subsidy, medicine. And the government of India started to invest more money in the construction of infrastructure like roads. That is called government expenditure. When government of India spends more money in infrastructure, it provides more employment. Because of employment, the income of the people also increases. When the income of the people increases, then people will start to demand more goods and services. So aggregate demand in the economy will increase. When government of India was doing fiscal policy, Reserve Bank of India reduced the repo rate. Guys, repo rate is the rate at which commercial banks borrow money from Reserve Bank. So whenever repo rate comes down in the economy, loan becomes cheaper because other rate of interests also come down as per repo rate. So repo rate is like a signal for the economy. So Reserve Bank of India reduced repo rate, other interest rates also came down. Because of that, two things happened. When rate of interest came down, people started to take more loan from the banks. For example, when the rate of interest is low in the bank, people take more loan to buy house, to buy their car, to buy refrigerator, laptop, etc. So consumers started to take more loan. That led to further increase in aggregate demand. See, we have used three arrows to show increase in aggregate demand. So aggregate demand increased because of both fiscal policy and monetary policy. On the other hand, when interest rate came down, the business community also started to take more loan and they started to invest money in the business to increase the production of goods and services. So aggregate supply in the economy also increased. But supply takes little time. 
to produce goods or services it takes more time but increase in demand is very fast so in the economy we observed after covid that increase in aggregate demand was higher than increase in aggregate supply whenever demand is high supply is low it leads to inflation so inflation happened in the economy when this inflation happened the world did not have any idea about what was coming along with this inflation so this inflation happened in india but over a period of time we saw that there was a tussle between russia and ukraine and we also observed that china faced another lockdown because of covid china is the supplier of both raw material as well as finished goods so in the global market there was shortage of raw material like semiconductor as well as finished goods because of russia ukraine tussle also the price of oil the price of energy metal and food grains increased in the world economy so on one hand we already had inflation on the other hand because of lack of supply of raw material and finished goods and because of global inflation aggregate supply in india could not increase a lot so demand was increasing very fast supply was not increasing it led to higher level of inflation this led the government of india to take action to ensure that first inflation is under control the rate of growth of gdp should increase and employment should also be created in the economy this was the problem that the government was facing to reduce inflation increase gdp and employment so in this topic let us see how the government of india used its budget to achieve these objectives before we look deeper into the fiscal policy and the budget of government of india let us revise what are the various components of budget in india what is the meaning of the budget budget basically contains various sources through which the government of india earns revenue and it also contains various ways in which the government of india makes expenditure budget can be divided into two types the first is called as revenue budget revenue budget contains how on day to day basis or on regular basis the government of india earns revenue and how they spend that revenue there is second type of budget called as capital budget capital budget basically talks about the assets that the government of india creates for example the government constructs a road or the government buys a defense aircraft that is called asset creation capital budget also talks about the liabilities created by government of india for example government of india takes loan from imf that is called as liability so assets and liability position is discussed under capital budget revenue budget can be divided into two parts first is called as revenue receipts and second is called as revenue expenditure revenue receipts means how on day to day basis or regular basis the government of india earns revenue government of india earns revenue through two different channels one is through taxes and the other is through non taxes there are two types of taxes that we use in india first is called direct tax for example the taxes paid by the businesses called as corporate tax second for example i as an individual pay tax which is income tax so that is also called as direct tax examples of indirect tax used in india is custom duties so whenever we import something in india we pay custom duties over that second type of indirect tax is excise duties so when we manufacture something in india the manufacturers have to pay excise duties third is service tax that tax is imposed over services and then we have a new tax called as gst which was introduced in 2017 so when the government of india earns revenue through direct and indirect taxes that is called as tax revenue then there are other sources through which the government of india earns revenue on day to day basis for example suppose government of india has given loan to somebody for that the government of india earns interest income that is called non tax revenue similarly we have public sector enterprises when they make profit that is also a non tax revenue suppose there is earthquake or flood and un gives us a grant grant means the payment which is given and not taken back so that grant is also a part of non tax revenue similarly the government also earns revenue through chalans fines etc that is others these two taken together tax revenue and non tax revenue is called as revenue receipts on day to day basis 
on regular basis what are the different ways in which government of india spends money first is salaries government of india pays salaries and pensions to the government employees that is revenue expenditure similarly when government of india takes loan government of india has to provide interest rate for that loan that is called as revenue expenditure so if the government of india takes more loan our interest payment will be high and our revenue expenditure will increase similarly the government of india provides subsidies to various sections of the society that is also a part of revenue expenditure similarly the government of india spends money in maintaining defense administration that is called as revenue expenditure the government of india also gives grants to state government the money which is given by center to state and union territories but it is not taken back that is called grant so grant from center to state is called as revenue expenditure revenue receipts plus revenue expenditure together is called as revenue budget now guys let us look at what is the meaning of capital budget capital budget can be divided into two parts first is called as capital receipts and second is called as capital expenditure capital receipts means different ways in which the government of india raises capital there are two ways in which the government of india raises capital first the government of india raises capital in such a way that the government does not have to return that capital to anybody for example when the government of india makes disinvestment or privatization of a public sector company the government of india gets capital that is government's capital government need not return it to somebody that type of capital is called non debt creating capital receipts because it is not a liability it becomes government's own capital similarly suppose government of india last year gave loan to somebody and the government of india gets that loan back this year now government of india does not have to return that money because this is government's own capital that is also called as non debt creating capital receipts on the other hand guys there are various types of capital receipts which is debt creating for example suppose the government of india takes loan from imf that loan is like a capital for the government but the government in future has to return it so that loan is called debt creating capital receipt similarly if government of india borrows money from rbi the government of india has to return that money that is debt creating similarly if government of india sells bonds in the market to public or institutions and the government of india collects capital that is a liability because in future the government has to return that money that is called market borrowings that is debt creating receipts so the capital receipts of the government of india contains two types of receipts first is non debt creating receipt which the government does not have to return to somebody second is debt creating receipt which is like a capital for the government today but the government has to return that capital in future now let us look at capital expenditure of the government of india how the government of india spends its capitals in creating assets so for example if government of india spends capital in construction of roads in buying a new building or in buying a defense aircraft this is called as capital expenditure similarly when government of india makes investment in shares or government of india gives loans to state government or union territories that is also called as capital expenditure so let us note a difference when the government of india gives grants to the state government or union territories that is called as revenue expenditure when the government of india gives loans to state government or union territories that is called as capital expenditure so what are the various ways in which the government of india earns revenue two ways first is revenue receipts and second is capital receipts so total revenue or total receipts of the government of india is equal to revenue plus capital receipts similarly what is the total expenditure of the government of india total expenditure is equal to revenue expenditure plus capital expenditure see guys total expenditure is equal to revenue expenditure plus capital expenditure and total receipts is equal to revenue receipts plus capital receipts now there is a term which is called as non debt receipt which means that type of receipt of the government which the government does not have to return to somebody what is that type of receipt let us see guys if we look carefully at the revenue receipt we have understood that revenue receipt is equal to tax plus non tax 
this receipt is government's own fund the government does not have to return it to somebody so revenue receipt plus non debt creating capital receipt for example the recovery of loan and disinvestment this is the capital which the government does not have to return to somebody so if we add tax revenue plus non tax revenue plus non debt creating capital receipts these three things together are called as non debt receipt or in other way we can say revenue receipt because the government does not have to return it so revenue receipt plus non debt creating capital receipt if we combine them that is called as non debt receipt example non debt receipt is equal to revenue receipt plus non debt capital receipt it is that type of receipt which the government does not have to return to somebody so guys what is the ideal scenario for any government the ideal scenario for any government is that the total income of the government should be greater than total expenditure but most of the time we observe that the expenditure of the government is here and the income is here so expenditure of the government is higher than its revenue so when expenditure is greater than revenue it is called deficit and the word deficit means shortfall or shortage so deficit is not a good thing all the governments try to minimize the deficit but what are the various types of deficit the first type of deficit is called as budget deficit or budgetary deficit it is the difference between total expenditure and total revenue what is total expenditure of the government the expenditure which is in the nature of capital expenditure and the expenditure which is in the nature of revenue expenditure if we add that it is called total expenditure see revenue expenditure plus capital and what is total receipt or total revenue of the government total revenue of the government is revenue receipt plus capital receipt so budget deficit is equal to total expenditure minus total receipt or total revenue what is revenue deficit revenue deficit means on day to day basis what is the shortage that the government of india is facing so revenue deficit is equal to revenue expenditure minus revenue receipts now whenever government of india faces shortage on day to day basis all the shortages that the government faces is not bad because for example suppose the government of india is facing a shortage of 20 crores but if we observe carefully suppose out of the 20 crore the government of india has given 1 crore rupees to state governments and state governments have used that 1 crore rupees to construct roads it is a good type of expenditure so if we remove 1 crore which has been used for productive purposes out of the total shortage of 20 crore then we have 19 crore shortage this 19 crore shortage is called as effective revenue deficit so effective revenue deficit is equal to revenue deficit minus grants which has been given for creation of capital assets now guys let us look at a very popular deficit it is called as fiscal deficit and let us also look at what is the meaning of primary deficit so what is fiscal deficit to explain fiscal deficit let us use one example so guys suppose that the total expenditure of the government of india this year is 100 crore what is the meaning of total expenditure total expenditure means revenue expenditure plus capital expenditure it is 100 crore now let us look at what is the value of non debt receipts by the government of india what is the meaning of non debt receipts non debt receipt means that receipt which the government does not have to return to somebody so non debt receipt means revenue receipt plus non debt capital receipt so if the total expenditure of the government of india is 100 crore and non debt receipt means the money which the government does not have to return to somebody is 80 crore the difference between these two 20 crore is called fiscal deficit so fiscal deficit is that shortage which the government of india borrows from the market because its non debt receipt falls short of its expenditure so this 20 crore is the amount which the government of india will borrow from the market in a loose sense but when government of india borrows this money from the market 20 crore is this 20 crore reflecting 
the financial position of the government of India or the real shortage of the government of India, which has happened because government became indisciplined? No. If you actually want to look at what is the level of indiscipline by the government in the current year, this year, then we have to do something else. For example, suppose that in the year 2021, the government of India had borrowed money from somebody and the government of India has to pay interest rate of 1 crore in the year 2022. And why do we have to pay interest rate? Because we borrowed money in 2021. So the government of India might have become indisciplined in 2021. For that we did the borrowing and now in 2022 we have to pay interest rate of 1 crore. In our example we saw that the fiscal deficit for the year 2022 was 100 crore minus 80 crore. 100 crore is the expenditure, 80 crore is non-debt receipt. So 20 crore is fiscal deficit means 20 crore is the borrowing. Out of this 20 crore borrowing, 1 crore was the money which the government borrowed to pay interest rate on the loans of 2021. So if we truly want to look at the level of indiscipline of the government in the year 2022, fiscal deficit will not show that. For that we calculate something called as primary deficit. What is primary deficit? So out of the fiscal deficit of the government of India, we have to remove that interest payment which the government is paying in the year 2022 for the loan taken in 2021. So this is the borrowing of the government in 2022. Out of this, we remove 1 crore because this 1 crore the government is not borrowing because the government became indisciplined this year. This 1 crore shows that the government was indisciplined last year. So remove the last year's indiscipline. You have 19 crore left. So this 19 crore borrowing shows the level of indiscipline of the government of India in the year 2022. This is called primary deficit. So <clears throat> what is the formula of primary deficit? Primary deficit is equal to fiscal deficit of this year minus interest payment which the government of India makes on the loans taken in the previous year. We can also write this formula in a different way. We can write it like this. So fiscal deficit minus primary deficit is equal to interest payment. Same formula can be written like this. Which means if we draw a graph. So suppose this is the fiscal deficit. In our example fiscal deficit was 20 crore and primary deficit was 19 crore. So in our graph we saw that fiscal deficit here and primary deficit is here and we saw the formula that if fiscal deficit is here, if primary deficit is here, the gap between fiscal and primary deficit is called interest payment. So if somebody tells us that the gap between fiscal deficit and primary deficit in India is increasing, that means the government of India is paying higher interest rate. So what is the gap between fiscal deficit and primary deficit? So interest payment. So if fiscal deficit here and primary deficit is here and there is a gap and this gap is increasing. That means the government of India borrowed more money last year. Because of that, the government of India's fiscal deficit is very high. So increasing gap between fiscal and primary deficit shows that the interest payment is high, which means in the previous years, higher level of loan was taken. So is our gap between fiscal and primary deficit in India increasing these days? We will see. This completes our basic analysis related to deficits. This box is very important for UPSC because a lot of questions are asked from here. Now let us look at two important things which is generally not discussed in public domain but IMF and government of India use these two indicators a lot to find out what is the health of the government. So guys suppose the total income of the government of India is equal to 100 crore this year and total expenditure of the government of India is 30 crore. So this is the income and this is the expenditure. What is the difference between these two? 70 crore. This 70 crore is the surplus which the government has. This 70 crore surplus is called headline fiscal balance. Now is headline fiscal balance the best indicator of the health of the economy? No. Suppose the government has a surplus of 70 crore. But out of this surplus, suppose the government of India uses 2 crores from this surplus to pay as interest 
on the loans taken in the last year. So suppose in the year 2022, the government of India took a loan and for that we have to pay interest rate of 2 crores. So from this surplus 70 crore, we will subtract 2 crore, we get 68 crore. This 68 crore is called primary balance. So primary balance actually shows the current health or current surplus of the government. So these two are used by IMF to look at the health of the economy. So guys, now let us solve some MCQs to polish our basic concepts related to budget and fiscal policies. Consider the following statements regarding effective revenue deficit of the government. It measures overall shortfall in revenue receipt compared to revenue expenditure. And it measures revenue deficit excluding the grants used by state governments for creation of capital assets. Which of the following is correct statement? So if we subtract total revenue from total expenditure, that is called as budgetary deficit. What is effective revenue deficit? It is equal to revenue deficit, this one revenue deficit minus grants which have been used for creation of assets. So this statement which says it measures overall shortfall in revenue receipts compared to revenue expenditure is wrong because it is talking about revenue deficit and the question is asking about effective revenue deficit. So effective revenue deficit is equal to revenue deficit minus grants. Second statement, it measures revenue deficit in excluding the grants, which is this statement. So the correct answer is only two. Question number two, it says, which of the following receipts are considered as a part of non-debt capital receipt? Now let us look at that non-debt capital receipt. So this is the budget. This is the capital budget. This is capital receipt. Capital receipts is of two types, non-debt capital receipt and debt capital receipt. Non-debt capital receipt means, for example, the government of India recovers its old loans or disinvestment money. That is non-debt capital receipt. But if the public sector enterprises are earning more profit, that is called as non-tax revenue receipt. Similarly, if the government of India get, gets some grants from international agencies, that is called as non-tax revenue receipt. In question number two, we are being asked about non-debt capital receipt. Disinvestment proceeds is definitely a non-debt capital receipt because this capital which the government gets, the government does not have to return it to somebody. So yes, this is non-debt capital receipts. Profit of public sector enterprises, this is a receipt, but this is called revenue receipt, RR, revenue receipt, not capital receipt. Similarly, grants from UN for earthquake relief work, this is also called revenue receipt. So these two are not the answer. The answer is only one. Question number three says, which of the following are the components of non-debt receipt of the government of India? So guys, what are the two different types of receipts of the government of India? Let us see. So if this is the budget of the government, the budget is of two types, revenue budget, capital budget. In revenue budget, we have revenue receipts and revenue expenditure. Revenue receipts means that kind of receipt which the government does not have to return to somebody. So yes, this is non-debt creating, right? Now capital budget is of two types. First is capital receipts and second is capital expenditure but this question talks about receipts so we will ignore the expenditure part capital budget contains of capital receipt capital receipt is of two types the first type of capital receipt is called as non-debt capital receipt for example the government gets capital by disinvesting a public sector enterprise or privatization. So for example, Air India was privatized. The government of India got capital. That is called non-debt capital receipt. Then there is debt creating capital receipt. What is that? So for example, the government of India gets loans from IMF. This loan has to be returned. So it is called debt creating capital receipt. So this gets cancelled. What is left? Revenue receipt and non-debt capital receipt. These two together are called as non-debt receipt. Revenue receipt is of two types, tax revenue and non-tax revenue. This question is asking 
that what is that kind of receipt which the government gets which the government does not have to return so answer is tax revenue the government does not have to return non tax the government does not have to return and non debt creating capital receipt like disinvestment so these three taken together is called as non debt receipt let us look at the options tax revenue yes non tax revenue yes capital receipt no because capital receipts is of two types non debt creating and debt creating only non debt creating comes under this so third option is wrong so only these two are the answer so let us see yes if instead of capital receipt it would have said non debt capital receipt then we would have marked this answer as all the three as right question number 4 says which of the following is or are considered to be a better indicator of current fiscal efforts of government of india headline fiscal balance so guys remember suppose the total revenue of the government of india this year is 100 crore this year and the total expenditure of the government of india is 90 crore which means what is the fiscal health of the government of india 10 crore but is it the real fiscal health of the government of india this year no because suppose that out of this 10 crore surplus that the government of india has this is called headline fiscal balance out of this 10 crore surplus that the government has suppose government of india has to pay 1 crore as interest rate on the loan taken last year so from this 10 crore we will subtract 1 crore and we get 9 crore so this 9 crore becomes the actual surplus with the government which the government can use somewhere this year for productive purposes this is called primary balance so primary balance means headline fiscal balance minus interest payment this shows the actual fiscal efforts of the government of india this year so the answer is only two now let us have a look at some data and trend related to fiscal deficit revenue deficit and primary deficit of the government of india so what did we observe that whenever the government of india's borrowing is high fiscal deficit will be high so let us see what actually happened so let's look at the fiscal deficit of the government of india in the year 2017-18 3.5 then it was 3.4 4.7 the government of india was trying to control the fiscal deficit as per nk singh committee recommendation but during covid the government of india borrowed a lot of money from the market why because government had to give more subsidy the government had reduced taxes also basically the government was trying to give relief to the economy during covid situation so government of india borrowed more money when the government borrows more money fiscal deficit is high so let us see the fiscal deficit became 9.2 percent then the government of india tried to control the borrowing and in the subsequent year which means 2021 fiscal deficit came down in 2022 also fiscal deficit came down similarly we observe that revenue deficit all of sudden increased during covid from 3.3 percent it became 7.3 and then it started to come down we don't have to memorize these numbers we have to look at the trend now let us look at primary deficit earlier the primary deficit was 0 0.4 close to zero and then primary deficit increased during covid and then it is reducing and now it's currently 2.8 percent and we have already discussed that if this is fiscal deficit from fiscal deficit if we remove the interest rate that we are paying on last year's loan we get primary deficit so what is the difference between fiscal deficit and primary deficit interest payment so guys in the economy whenever the gap between fiscal deficit and primary deficit increases that means interest rate is increasing during covid the government took a lot of loan from the market on those loans today the government of india is paying interest rate which means the gap between fiscal and primary deficit must be increasing in india let us see if we look at 2019-20 before covid the gap between fiscal deficit and primary deficit was 3.1 now the gap between fiscal deficit and primary deficit is 3.6 which means currently the government of india is borrowing a lot of money and a major part of the money is going as interest payment because we borrowed lot of money during covid so our fiscal deficit and primary deficit gap is increasing 
it is also shown in this graph you see this is fiscal deficit and this lower line is primary deficit see the gap has widened now let us look at revenue budget revenue budget if you recall is equal to revenue receipt plus revenue expenditure let us look at the trend of revenue receipt remember revenue receipt is of two types tax revenue and non tax revenue so let us first look at the non tax revenue so for example the interest receipt of the government of india has come down the profits of public sector enterprises have come down external grants have almost remained same others means collection of chalans etc it has reduced so overall the non tax revenue has come down you see let us look at the tax revenue now in terms of tax revenue there are two types of taxes direct taxes indirect taxes if you notice carefully our tax revenue has increased overall direct taxes have increased so corporate taxes have increased income taxes have increased indirect taxes custom duties have increased gst has increased but there is reduction of excise duty only this has come down so overall our tax revenue has increased all the components of tax revenue have gone up except for one component which is excise duty why you see government of india imports a lot of crude oil from the global market during covid in the global market the price of crude oil came down when we import crude oil at cheaper rate then we convert that crude oil in our factories and refineries into refined form of petrol and diesel so we produce petrol and diesel using raw material which is imported during covid we were importing cheaper crude oil so the price of petrol and diesel in india was low the government of india imposed excise duty on petrol and diesel because government thought prices are low if we impose excise duties government will earn more money and that money can be used to support the economy through different subsidies during covid times so excise duty collection during covid was very high but after covid in last one or two years the oil prices crude oil prices in the world market has increased indian companies refineries are importing costly crude oil now which means the price of petrol and diesel has become costly in india so the government had to reduce the excise duties to control the price of petrol and diesel that is why the collection of excise duties came down now let us look at the revenue expenditure of the government of india what is revenue expenditure the day to day expenditure of the government of india so guys the salary component has increased pension has increased interest payment has increased and i told you that during covid government borrowed a lot of money so we are paying interest rate but subsidies have come down in india so during covid the government of india had increased the subsidy level but after covid that increased subsidy has been slowly phased out has slowly reduced and the defense expenditure is high the reduction of the subsidy is is good enough because the reduction of the subsidy actually led to the overall reduction of the revenue expenditure of the government of india so the subsidy reduced to that extent that overall revenue expenditure of government of india came down i have created this small data set let me explain what this data set means so suppose guys on day to day basis the government of india is spending 100 rupees just on day to day basis out of 100 rupees 13 rupees is being spent on salary 6.4 rupees on pension 29 rupees on interest payment which is very very high and 10 rupees is going on subsidies and 7 rupees on defense this interest component has to be reduced so borrowing is not a good thing if we are not using that borrowing to create capital assets in the economy now if we look at the reduction of subsidy so in the year 2020 if the national income of india or gdp of india was 100 rupees roughly 15.6 rupees was given as subsidy this is the level of subsidy 15.6% in the year 2022 the level of subsidy has come down to 12.4% of gdp so from 15.6% of gdp our subsidy has come down to 12. Four percent, and this has led to overall reduction in the revenue expenditure. 
But there is one more problem related to revenue expenditure. If you look at the type of expenditures that we have, these are mostly committed in nature. And the government of India cannot reduce revenue expenditure beyond a limit. And I think we have already reached that limit given the current economic scenario. A question which is asked generally in the Indian economy is that after GST system was introduced in India, has the collection of taxes or tax revenue of the government increased in India? Now let us look at the trend related to GST tax collection. Now guys, there is a beautiful formula in the field of taxation called as tax buoyancy. The formula says tax buoyancy is equal to percentage change in tax revenue upon percentage change in GDP where we have to keep the tax rate constant. What is the meaning of that? The general meaning of this is that whenever the national income or GDP of India goes up, are we able to increase our tax revenue also? Because when income increases, tax revenue should increase. If that happens, then that type of taxation system is called as buoyant tax. So when GST was introduced in India, it was hoped that after GST, whenever GDP of India will rise, government will be able to collect more taxes. Has that happened? Let us see. Economic survey says that according to this formula of tax buoyancy, if we calculate the tax buoyancy of India before GST was introduced, it was 0.9988. But if we calculate the tax buoyancy of India after GST was introduced, it is 1.1299, which means our taxation system has become more buoyant after GST has been introduced, which means Currently, whenever our GDP is increasing, we are able to collect more tax revenue. Why has this happened? Economic survey says that there are few reasons for that. Number one, after COVID, now the economy is on the recovery path. Because of that, our GDP is increasing and so is our tax collection. Second, because of use of technology and because of use of new systems like artificial intelligence, etc., the government of India is able to find out the tax defaulters. And we are also using more digital payments these days. So those people who want to evade taxes or hide their income, it is very difficult. So the government has also been able to reduce the tax evaders. For example, in the year 2017, roughly 70 lakh people were paying GST. Currently it has doubled and now roughly 1.4 crore people are paying GST. Another reason for improved buoyancy of Indian taxation system is that government has been able to take action against fake billing. So for example guys, in the business community, there are many tax benefits which are given by the government of India to the companies or producers. Sometimes people take disadvantage of this situation. They have not produced something to the level that they should get the benefit, but they claim such benefits from the government in terms of taxation. The government has been able to reduce this type of unfair or fake benefits which the business community has been able to take. That has also increased our tax revenue. Then the government says in the economic survey that the government has been able to rationalize the GST rates to correct inverted duty structure. This correction has also increased our tax revenue. What is the meaning of inverted duty structure? Let me explain through an example. Now guys, suppose that you have a factory and you are the producer of mobile phone in India. This is the mobile phone that you are producing. To produce this mobile phone, suppose you are importing mobile screen from South Korea and the price of the screen is 5000 rupees. When you import this screen, the government of India imposes a tax on it, which is 30% tax. So, 30% of 5000 is 1500 rupees. So total money that you pay for that mobile screen, it is 6500. Out of that 1500 is tax and 5000 is actually the price of the screen. In India, there is a rule. Whenever a producer buys any input and over that, if the producer pays any taxes, later on, the producer can get that amount of tax reimbursed from the government of India. That is called as input tax credit. Now suppose you are this producer, you have got your mobile screen and now you are using this mobile screen to manufacture the mobile phone. The price of the mobile phone, you want to keep it at 10,000 rupees. But the government of India imposes a 10% GST on this. 
So the total price of the mobile phone for consumer becomes 10,000 plus 10% 10 GST. What is 10% GST? 1,000 rupees. So the price of the mobile phone in the market becomes 11,000 rupees. So you sell this mobile phone for 11,000. When you are selling it, you are collecting 1,000 rupees as GST. This 1,000 rupees you have to pay to the government. But remember, there was 1,500 rupees which you have already paid on the inputs, which you have to take back from the government. And you have to pay 1,000 rupees to the government. Government of India says, whenever a producer is paying something to the government of India, from that money only, the input tax credit has to be taken back. Which means, from this 1,000 rupees, you have to take back 1,500 rupees from the government. How will you do that? Because the money that you have to pay to the government is less. The money that you have to take from the government is more. So how will you take 1,500 rupees from 1,000 rupees? This looks little weird. This kind of situation is called as inverted duty structure. And why has this happened? Inverted duty structure has happened because the tax that the government puts on the input 30% is higher than the tax that the government puts on the output. Because of that, the producers are not able to claim their input tax credit from this amount. Government of India is trying to remove this anomaly by reducing this tax. Through these methods, the government of India has been able to increase the tax revenue. Now guys, there is something very interesting given in the economic survey. I'll tell you using an example. So suppose you are uh, indulging in self-study for one week. On day one, you studied for seven hours, which is good. On day two, eight hours. Day three, one hour. Day four, no study. Day five, three hours. Day four, one hour. Right. So what is happening here? On some days, you are studying for eight hours. Some days, one hour. Some days, not studying. Again, 10 hours. This is haphazard. This is not consistent. How do we get good results in life when we are more disciplined and when we are more consistent? Similarly, if the GST collection is happening consistently every month, then we will get to know that the economy is in healthy condition. So let us look at the GST collection in the year 2022. See, what is the trend of GST collection? It's something like this, which is consistent, which means every month the level of GST collection has been at a certain level. This is consistent which shows economic revival. Earlier, what was the case of GST collection? Sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes up. Here also, up, down, up, down, which shows crisis-like situation. Now, let us have a look at the trend related to capital account. So guys, capital account can be divided into two parts, capital receipts and capital expenditure. There are two types of capital receipts that we have discussed. One is non-debt creating, which means that capital which the government does not have to return. And one is debt creating, the capital that the government has to return. So for example, let us look at the non-debt creating capital receipts. So net recovery of loan and advances have come down, which is government of India gave loans, which the government of India has not been able to recover. So loans have come down. Disinvestment. So government of India had set a target of 65,000 crore through disinvestment for the year 2022-23, but the government has not been able to achieve the target. So they could only reach half the mark. In fact, they could not even touch half the mark. The real disinvestment that the government achieved was somewhere around 31,000 crore. So for the year 2023-24, the government of India has reduced the disinvestment target to 51,000 crores. But the government of India has mentioned in the survey that between the year 2014 till 2022, the government of India was able to garner around rupees 4 lakh crores through disinvestment. Now as far as the debt creating capital receipts are concerned, market loans have increased and loans are debt creating. Now let us look at capital expenditure of the government. Why is capital expenditure important? So for example, suppose government of India constructs more roads and railway. Let us see what is the impact of that on the society. When more roads and railways are created, of course, people will get more employment. It will lead to increase in aggregate demand in the society. When the government of India provides more roads and railways, private sector is also motivated to invest more in industries, etc. Otherwise, during a situation like COVID, the private sector will become risk averse and they don't want to take risk. But if they see that the government is investing more money in infrastructure, private sector is also motivated. 
and the moment we have roads and railways it becomes easy to carry the raw material to the industries and to carry the finished product to the market which means supply factors become more positive now let us see if in india the capital expenditure has increased so what are the different types of capital expenditure asset creation so has the government of india increased more assets like roads railway etc yes there has been an increased expenditure on roads railway defense then telecom housing etc we can see the percentage there is a negative percentage on housing and urban affairs and then there is a negative percentage on space related asset creation and health and family welfare this health and family welfare is low because we are comparing it with the covid time when it was very high that is why it looks low and what is the loan given by the center to the state government has it increased yes the loans given by center to state and union territories have increased suppose guys that your parents have given you pocket money of 1000 rupees out of 1000 rupees suppose you start to buy coffee every day and you end up buying coffee of entire 1000 rupees you did not spend even a single rupee in buying books is it a good thing bad thing it's not that great why because if you just have coffee then your money is also exhausted and coffee once consumed does not increase your productivity or knowledge coffee is also important but only coffee expenditure should be avoided now suppose your parents gave you 1000 rupees out of 1000 rupees you spent 400 rupees on coffee and 600 rupees in buying good books books improve our capability and knowledge it makes us more empowered is this good type of expenditure that we are indulging into 100% yes similarly whenever government of india earns income gdp 100 rupees out of 100 rupees we want to know that how much is going in meeting day to day expenditure by the government of india and how much out of 100 rupees is being used to create something good in the economy like construction of roads bridges schools and hospitals so there are two types of expenditure one is revenue expenditure to meet day to day requirements like government of india pays salaries pensions etc it is this is called as revenue expenditure and when government of india spends money in construction of roads bridges schools and hospital this is called capital expenditure so in the economy the revenue expenditure should be controlled and capital expenditure should increase and total expenditure is equal to revenue plus capital expenditure when do we say that the quality of expenditure of a country is good when more money is invested in capital expenditure so let us examine what is india's quality of expenditure so total expenditure is equal to revenue expenditure plus capital expenditure so suppose india earns 100 rupees gdp out of that in the year 2020 how much did we spend total expenditure 17.7% of gdp was our total expenditure was it high let us look at our expenditure in the year 2019 just before covid i have written that in the small bracket 13% so 13% of our gdp was our total expenditure in the year 2019 it became 17% so which means drastically increased why to meet the covid situation but later on in the year 2021 and 22 our total expenditure came down now let us look at two components of total expenditure first is called capital expenditure second is called revenue expenditure our capital expenditure in the year 2019 was 1.7% during covid 2.2% then 2.5 2.9 so our capital expenditure is going up see this is our capital expenditure 2.2 2.5 2.9 now let us look at our revenue expenditure our revenue expenditure in the year 2019 was 11.7% then during covid it became 15.6% it increased but then it started to come down so capital expenditure is going up revenue expenditure is coming down as a percentage of gdp economic survey also says that if you look at the capital expenditure of india between the year 2008 till the year 2019 for 10 11 years average the capital expenditure of india was 1.7% of gdp now it has become 2.5 in 2021 in 2022 2.9 which means it is increasing at a good speed another way of looking at it is that suppose that we look at total expenditure of india 
So suppose overall the government of India is spending 100 rupees every year. Out of 100 rupees, how much is our capital expenditure? Means expenditure in assets like roads, airport, etc. And how much is our revenue expenditure? Now we see that in the year 2017-18, the amount of our capital expenditure, so if total expenditure was 100, 12.3. 3% which means 12.3 rupees was our capital expenditure. Now let us look at the situation here. So for example in the year 2020 during COVID. So our capital expenditure was 12.1% revenue expenditure 87%. Then after COVID situation our capital expenditure is 15.6%. So out of 100 rupees total expenditure 15.6% is capital earlier 12.1. So yes it has increased. And in the year 2022, our capital expenditure is 19. So overall, we see from 12 to 15 to 19, capital expenditure is increasing. And what is our revenue expenditure? 87, 84, 81. So revenue expenditure is coming down. Now we are going to understand two very important types of fiscal policies. First is called counter cyclical fiscal policy. Second is called as pro cyclical fiscal policy. Counter cycle means going against the natural cycle and pro cycle means going with the cycle. Let us try to understand. So guys, would you agree if I tell you that life goes through different phases? Sometimes we are very happy in life. We get everything that we want. That's a great phase. But sometimes we are not able to get the result that we want. There is a delay in, in getting what we ask from life. So that is a slowdown phase in our life. That is called as a crisis phase. Similarly, every business and the economy goes through a phase when there is a lot of employment in the economy, companies are doing good, economy is doing good. That phase is called boom phase, when everything is nice. But there is also a phase in the economy and in the company when things are not going that fine, slow down and crisis kind of situation. So life is a mix of both. So whenever things are fine in the economy, more jobs are created, production is very high, inflation is under control. This is called boom phase. The economy is like this. We can see the curve going up. But when things are not so nice in the economy and it happens. So the economy moves below this line. So this is called as recession phase. So what happens when we are in very good phase of life, when we are doing very well in life, we get more friends, they come to us. So if we are going through this phase in life, more friends will come and we will become even more happy. Similarly, if the opposite happens, suppose we are in a crisis situation and then we go to somebody and tell them that, hey, will you please help me? They will not. So most of the people in life who come in your life when you are successful, they will leave you when you are not so successful. So is this the same thing which happens in the economy? Let us see. Suppose the economy is going through a great phase like this, which is called boom. And suppose government of India says, oh, there is boom in the economy. Let me also construct more roads, more hospital. And when the government construct more roads and hospitals, more jobs are created. So the economy from here will move here. See, when we are in boom phase, when everything is fine, government also spends more money in the economy and economy moves here. So from this point, we move up. So there is a shift. But when there is a recession in the economy, suppose this is the recession phase of the economy, the government of India says, why should I spend more money? Because there is more recession. So what will happen? Economy will go in deeper recession. If the government does not come to help, economy will move from here to here. So recession becomes deep. This type of policy is called as pro-cyclical fiscal policy. What happens in pro-cyclical fiscal policy? Under pro-cyclical fiscal policy, whenever there is boom, the government of India spends more money in the economy. And whenever there is a recession, the government of India also reduces its expenditure. This is called pro-cyclical. Do you think it's a good policy? No. There are some friends in life, guys. So when we become successful, when we become famous, we get many friends. Amongst them, there are those people who will never leave us even if we are facing problem. In fact, they will come to us and they will say that, do you need extra help? And they will help us. 
that is the kind of friends that we want in life and we should also become that kind of person for others similarly suppose we look at a different scenario the scenario is that suppose the economy goes in recession like this this is the recession phase now suppose the government of india comes and says oh there is a recession in the economy that means people are losing jobs output is low and there is pessimism in the economy immediately the government of india starts to construct more roads more hospitals more infrastructure through that the government of india provides more jobs income of the people will increase and what will happen if the economy is here at the bottom the economy will shift little up and it will behave like this which means during recession phase the government of india instead of reducing the expenditure increases the expenditure so this takes the economy out of crisis and when the economy is in good phase boom phase the government of india says i don't need to spend much because anyway economy is doing fine so this is going against the cycle when economy is in boom phase the government of india doesn't unnecessarily spend because anyway private sector is spending money but when there is crisis the government of india comes to help and starts to construct more roads more bridges to provide more employment this type of policy is called counter cyclical fiscal policy and you know our old kings and and uh, our old empires knew this fiscal policy so whenever there used to be crisis in our old kingdoms the kings in the old times ancient times they used to construct more palaces more canals and more infrastructure because through that the kings used to provide more jobs to the people so during recession they used to increase more investment this is called counter cyclical fiscal policy let us see this is how the pro cyclical fiscal policy works when things are fine government spends more pro cyclical and when economy is in recession the government does not spend and economy goes deeper into recession and what is counter cyclical fiscal policy when economy is doing fine the government does not spend too much but when economy is in crisis the government spends more and economy comes out of crisis so the i have created this table so this is boom this is recession this is counter cyclical fiscal policy counter cyclical means whenever there is boom the government reduces the expenditure this is called contractionary fiscal policy the government reduces the expenditure and whenever there is recession the government increases the expenditure in pro cyclical fiscal policy during boom the government increases the expenditure and during recession the government reduces the expenditure let us see which policy was adopted by government of india during covid crisis see if we look carefully we can see that total expenditure of government of india during 2019-20 was around 13.4% of gdp which means out of 100 rupees income the government of india was spending 13.4% during covid 2020 the government of india increased the expenditure in the economy which expenditure increased both revenue and capital this is called counter cyclical fiscal policy if the government would not have spent money we would have gone deeper into recession but when the economy started to recover the government expenditure started to come down but even now the expenditure has remained at 15.3% which is much higher than pre covid time so yes in india we followed counter cyclical fiscal policy and we have already seen this graph we have seen that in the overall expenditure of government of india the share of capital expenditure has increased more this is share of capital expenditure it has increased more this completes the analysis of the central government finances now we will have a look at the finances of the state governments now in terms of the state government finances we will look at two things the revenue earned by the state government and the expenditure by the state governments so there are two sources of revenue first is tax revenue non tax revenue the tax revenue of the state governments of india have increased by 17.5% year on year which means this is the growth in the tax revenue in 2022 compared to 2021 and non tax revenue has increased by 25.6% now let us look at the expenditure side revenue expenditure of the state government has increased by 10.4% and capital expenditure has increased by 16% capital expenditure means more asset has been created by state which is very notable this is a good development in terms of the gross fiscal deficit of all the state governments of india we see that the gross fiscal deficit of the states have been coming down 
it was very high during COVID, but it came down. And similarly, we see that revenue deficit is also reducing. You see, just like the central government, state governments constantly try to bring more reforms to increase their revenue. Economic survey talks about these four ways in which the state governments have been trying to increase their revenue as well. Number one, Reserve Bank of India wrote a report in which they said that the property taxes collected by the state governments in India is very low compared to other countries. So, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Kerala, these state governments have increased their property taxes which has increased their revenue. Similarly, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Telangana, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, Kerala, Assam and Puducherry. These states have increased their power tariffs to increase their revenue. Some states of India made changes in their liquor policy. For example, UP got a new liquor policy where the license fee, the registration charges related to liquor has been increased. And also, many state governments of India, they own their own companies called as state public sector enterprises. So they are going for disinvestment and monetization. This has also increased their revenue. Now let us have a look at the resource mobilization between central government and state government. By the way, this particular topic is mentioned in GS paper 3 syllabus of UPSC. It's a very important part and from here a lot of questions are asked. So basically this talks about different ways and methods through which the central government transfers resources to the state government. So basically there are four methods through which the central government transfer resources to state. The first is called devolution to states. The second is called transfer from center to state. The third is called GST compensation from center to state. And fourth is called interest free loan from center to state. So let us discuss each of these one by one. Now guys, there are three different ways in which the central government collects taxes. The first is normal taxes. So see this rupee symbol, this is the tax collection of the central government. The second is called as cess and third is called as surcharge. What is cess and what is surcharge? So for example, suppose the government of India has to promote education in India or the government of India has to construct irrigation system. Government of India will impose a cess on the Indians called as agriculture infrastructure development cess or education cess and the money collected through cess can only be used for the specific purpose for which the cess has been collected. So if the government of India is calling it as agriculture infrastructure cess that money has to be used only for development of infrastructure. If it is education says that money only has to be used for development of education. What is a surcharge? Surcharge is also imposed over and above taxes in India. And once the government, central government collects surcharge, they can use this money for any purpose that they want. But cess has to be used only for a specific purpose for which it has been collected. So if we take a big box like this and if we put the tax revenue collected by the government, cess and surcharge, this bigger box is called as gross tax revenue. The government of India also incurs some cost in collecting these taxes, cess and surcharge. So for example, suppose government of India has appointed these two people to collect the taxes and government is paying salary to them. This is that salary. So now finance commission says, and finance commission is a constitutional body that if this is the total gross tax revenue of the central government from this the central government has to remove the cess and the surcharge and the central government also has to deduct the cost of collection of taxes so suppose this is the cost of collection of taxes and this is the cess and surcharge so finance commission says that from this gross tax revenue this box has to be removed and this has to be removed. What is left? We are left with this box. This particular box full of cash is called as net proceeds. According to finance commission, 41% of this net proceeds has to be transferred from center to state. This is called devolution to states. So if you look at the formula, net proceeds is equal to gross tax revenue minus cess minus surcharge minus collection cost. What has happened in India is over a period of time the central government has acted smartly. The central government has started to increase the size of 
सेस एंड सर चार्ज सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट नोज दैट इफ दे इंक्रीज सेस एंड सर चार्ज देन फ्रॉम द बिग बॉक्स सेस एंड सर चार्ज विल बी रिमूव एंड ओनली सेंटर विल कीप द सेस एंड सर चार्ज सो ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम our gross tax revenue gtr what is gross tax revenue taxes plus cess plus surcharge gross tax revenue has increased but why has it increased it has increased mostly because of cess and surcharge which is not given to the states so the share of cess and surcharge see, is increasing in india in the gross tax revenue whereas from this bigger box a small percentage is going to the states which percentage is going to the state so the percentage going to the state is 41% of this small box this one so our gross tax revenue is increasing but it is increasing mostly because of cess and surcharge so center is keeping a higher proportion and states are getting lesser so you see the share of states are coming down in that sense why because cess and surcharge is increasing in india now the second type of resource sharing between center to state is called as transfer from center to states so basically there are three different ways in which transfer from center to state happens the first is called centrally sponsored schemes so guys there are many schemes in which both central government contributes and state governments also contribute so in india we have observed that in the year 2022 compared to 2021 the contribution by center has increased towards the scheme so the arrow is going up the second type of transfer is called as finance commission grants there are basically four different types of grants which center has to provide to state as recommended by finance commission so finance commission says that whenever the center provides 41% of the net proceeds to the states but if this 41% is not sufficient for the states to meet day to day expenditure then whatever is the extra requirement that has to be provided from center to state called as post devolution revenue deficit grant and center also has to provide disaster management grant local body grant and health sector grant to the state four types of grants so it was recommended by finance commission that the center should provide almost this amount as the grant to the state but in reality the center has provided only 161230 crore so there is a shortfall of around 30000 crores the third type of transfer from center to state is other grants loans and transfers which has also increased now guys let us look at the gst compensation there was a system of indirect taxation in india so most of the important indirect taxes in india they were merged and we created gst and we launched it in the year 2017 when gst was launched the central government promised the state governments that after gst comes into existence if the revenue received by the state governments through gst is lower then the revenue that the state governments were getting in the pre gst era then whatever is the shortfall center would provide that money to the states as compensation that is called gst compensation under the compensation the central government did not promise that in future if there is a covid crisis or there is a health crisis then center would provide gst compensation so the meaning of the compensation was restricted and compensation did not cover any crisis in future so in the year 2022 23 how much gst compensation has been released by center to states 1.16 lakh crores there is a discussion which has been given in the economic survey which says that if we look at all those taxes which existed in india before gst so from those taxes the state governments were earning some tax revenue after gst came the state governments are earning tax revenue through gst collection so economic survey is comparing those two and economic survey has given the result that after the coming of gst total fiscal resources that are going to the state government from taxes which have been merged under gst has increased which means through gst state governments are getting more revenue 
than they were getting in the pre-GST era through those individual indirect taxes. Which means another way of saying that is that after GST has come in India, the tax buoyancy has improved compared to pre-GST phase and we have already discussed this point. The fourth component of resource sharing between center and state is interest-free loan from center to state for capital expenditure. See, we all know that central government has been increasing capital expenditure to create more assets like roads, hospitals and schools in the economy. But if state governments do not contribute by increasing capital expenditure in their respective states, country cannot progress. But during COVID, the state governments were not having revenue. So how could they construct more assets in their respective state? So the center started a scheme. That scheme is called as a scheme for special assistance to state for capital investment. Under it, the central government has started to offer zero interest loan for 50 years to state governments. So for example, in the year 2020-21, the central government announced a 12,000 crore rupees loan to the states at zero rate of interest. In the year 2021-22, 14,186 crore. And the year 2022-23, 1.05 lakh crore rupees loan at zero rate of interest to all the states of India. But there is only one condition for the state governments to take this loan. The condition is they have to use this loan or a major part of this loan has to be used for capital expenditure, which means expenditure or investment to create more roads, more internet connections, uh, and similarly, for example, for disinvestment, for monetization, for these things, this loan has to be used. If the state governments agree to use this loan that they are getting, so that they create more infrastructure, then more roads, more digital infrastructure, optical fiber, urban infrastructure, then this money will be provided to the state government at 0% rate of interest. This will definitely improve the capital expenditure and overall productivity of the economy. So guys, life does not always remain stable. There are times in life when we want to achieve big things, we want to grow, but we do not have the resources. Many a times we borrow that money or resource and then we use that money productively to grow and flourish. And once we have our own resources, we return that money. So when we borrow resources from somebody that is called debt, the question is, how much can we borrow in a sustainable manner so that we can return it in future? And once we borrow, what do we do that with that resource so that we remain more stable? That is the question that we are trying to examine from government's perspective. So we are going to look at what is the debt of the government, which means what is the money that the government has borrowed, which government has to return. So the debt of the government can also be called as government liability. So government liability divided into three different categories. The first type of government liability is called as public debt. The second is called as public account liability and the third is called as extra budgetary resources. Let us start with public debt. So many a times the government of India sells bonds in the market and collects cash. That is called as market borrowing. Similarly, the government of India sells treasury bills and collects cash. That is also called market borrowing. That is called internal debt. Why? Because the government of India has sold the bonds and the treasury bills within India. So the money that the government collects through that is in rupee. This is called rupee denominated debt. Now on the other hand guys, many a times the government of India takes loan from for example IMF or when NRIs deposit cash here. So that is called as external debt because we have borrowed that money from outside India that is denominated in foreign currency. Let us say, for example, in dollars, this is called dollar denominated debt. So out of the debt that we have, around 95% of our debt is internal and approximately 5% is external debt, which is good. Now, another way of saying that is, that around 95% of our debt is rupee denominated, approximately 5% is foreign currency or dollar denominated. Another feature of our debt is that most of the debt that we have in India is long term debt. Our short term debts are coming down. So when you borrow money from somebody for one year or six months, that creates pressure and we have to return it very fast. 
But if we borrow money for a little longer period, we get some liberty to return the money slowly. So initially, the average length of government of India's debt was around 9.7 years. Now it has increased well beyond 11 years. So the maturity period of our debt has increased. There is one more feature of the debt by government of India that most of the debt that the government of India has or the money that the government of India has borrowed is at almost fixed rate of interest, which means we are stable in that. The second type of debt or government liability is public account liability. So for example, suppose that we buy national small saving certificates or the provident fund of the public these are the money which belongs to the public but the government is the custodian of this money because the public has been involved in these schemes so our money is lying with the government but that is not government money because in future government has to return that money so that is called public account liability similarly many a times the government of india through its public sector enterprises they borrow money as loan so if the government of india asks its public sector enterprises to take loans that is called as extra budgetary resources and mind you extra budgetary resources are not a part of fiscal deficit so sometimes to keep the fiscal deficit figures in control many a times the government of india borrows through extra budgetary resources now let us see in india what is the situation of government liability so as i told you that around 95% of our debt is internal, around 5% is external. Similarly, we have already discussed that the rate of interest at which the government borrows money is almost fixed rate of interest. So that does not create volatility. And what is the maturity period of the government securities or government bonds? On an average, in 2010, the maturity period used to be 9.7 years. Now it is 11.7 years. Maturity period has increased. So our total public debt has increased, public account liability has come down in the year 2022 and extra budgetary resources have almost remained constant, which means that the government of India did not ask the public sector enterprises to take more money to control fiscal deficit. If we look at the debt to GDP ratio of the central government, which means if our income is 100 rupees, how much money we have to return to others? That is called debt to GDP ratio of the central government. So in the COVID year 2020-21, the debt to GDP ratio of central government was 59.2%. Now it has come down to 56.7%. If you look at the debt to GDP ratio of the world on an average, according to IMF, the global debt to GDP ratio is 91% of GDP. But India's debt to GDP ratio has come down to 56.7%. Now guys, let us look at the general government finances. What is general government? When we look at central government and the state government together, that is called general government. So if you look at the debt to GDP ratio of general government, which means here we are adding the debt of the central government as well as debt of the state government. So overall debt to GDP ratio of general government in India in the COVID year, it was 89.6%. Now it reduced to 84.5% and then 86.5%. Similarly, if we look at the fiscal deficit ratio of the general government, it has been coming down. And similarly, the revenue deficit of the general government has been coming down. There is this interesting comparison given in the economic survey, which says that if we compare the debt to GDP ratio of different countries in the year 2005 with 2021, we observe that, for example, the debt to GDP ratio of India, general government, in the year 2005 was 81%, now it is 84%. It has not increased too much. But if you look at the debt to GDP ratio in Japan, 2005, 174%, now 263%. Look at US from 66% to 128. UK, same story. France, same story. China, same story. But if you look at these countries, Brazil, India, Germany, Indonesia, the situation is much better, which means the rate at which the debt has increased is not that alarming in these countries. 
example brazil india germany and indonesia so economic survey is arguing that our debt to gdp ratio is manageable that brings us to another question so the question is how sustainable is india's debt economic survey argues that the economic debt of a country like india depends upon three factors the first is called as primary deficit the second is called as growth rate and third is called as cost of government debt let us try to see what these factors mean economic survey says that our primary deficit should be as close as possible to zero in fact nk singh committee also said that our primary deficit should be zero in the long run what is the meaning of zero primary deficit so primary deficit is equal to zero means see if this becomes zero then fiscal deficit is equal to interest payment so if our primary deficit is zero in india that means the government of india is borrowing money only to pay the interest rate on the loans taken last year which means we were indisciplined last year but this year we are disciplined because this year we are having fiscal deficit only so that we can pay the interest rate on the loans taken last year so the ideal situation is primary deficit according to economic survey and nk singh committee should be as close to zero as possible the second factor that is important for a country to have a sustainable debt is that the rate of growth should be good enough that is called g and the third factor is that whenever a country borrows money for example whenever the government of india borrows money the government of india has to give interest rate that interest rate should not be very high let us try to understand this through an example so suppose that government of india in the year 2022 borrows 100 crore rupees this is our loan when we borrow money we have to pay interest rate so now the government of india has to pay interest rate of 8.8% so guys in the year 2023 which means this year so when did we borrow money last year and when do we have to pay interest rate from this year so in the year 2023 suppose our economy is growing at the rate of 12.8% which means the growth rate of gdp which is small g becomes 12.8% very good rate of growth now if we use our 100 rupees efficiently so suppose we borrowed 100 crore rupees and we are using it in industries productive purposes so our 100 crore will grow by 12.8% so our 100 crore will become 100 into 1.128 which means 112.8 crore because we borrowed this money and we are using it productively and what is the growth rate in the economy 12.8% so 100 crore will become 112.8 crore since we borrowed 100 crore last year this year we have to pay interest and we also have to return the 100 crore so how much money will we return we will return 100 plus 8.8% 8 so 108.8 crore is the money which we have to return and what is the income we have created in the economy 112.8 and the return is 108.8 so what is the surplus that we have income minus what we have to return and the money that we have to ret return is called debt service So what is the net income that we have surplus 112.8 minus 108.8 4 crore So this 4 4 crore is our surplus in the economy So economic survey argues that whenever the rate of growth of the economy which is 12.8% here example g whenever this one 12.8% is greater than the rate of interest at which we have taken loan so g is greater than r whenever this happens in the economy the loan that the economy has taken is sustainable and we will be in a position to return that loan let us look at it through this diagram so economic survey says that when our rate of growth of gdp is higher than rate of interest that we have to pay on the loans whenever g is greater than r then the debt in the economy is sustainable so guys this concludes our lecture on fiscal policy and budget and since this topic is very important from upsc perspective we must revise it before the exams thank you so much